Good morning. Hello. Oh, there are people here. Good morning. <laughs> Good. Now I can hear you. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us uh, today as we recognize, educate, and celebrate those who made us free. This year's theme, theme is Heal, Repair, Educate, Celebrate, and Recognize. If you forget, I think they are on that uh, banner over there. Um, it's, good, uh, it's a good reminder. Um, my name is Eve Gakunde, uh, and you're going to be stuck with me for the next two hours as, as uh, I was a task to be your host. Um, but I, I uh, promise we have, uh, we'll have a good time. We have a good program today. Um, a few questions uh, that I want to uh, give you as, so you can think about, about them uh, during this, this day and uh, um, maybe for the next few days. Um, one is, uh, why is it important to recognize the Juneteenth event and uh, to celebrate those who fought hard to ensure free, full freedom for black people? The second one is, uh, in this century, why do we need to educate ourselves about the importance of the Juneteenth event in the American history? And the last one, why are we here today? Inspired by this event, what small actions should I or should you take? Or what changes should you make in your daily life to really accommodate what this event mean. So as we spend time, to, uh, time together today, I want us to be fully present, learn from our excellent speakers, and come up with uh, uh, answers to these questions. So I want to uh, introduce uh, Chris Roberts, uh, uh, Councillor Chris Roberts. He's going to do a proclamation for us. Chris. Before I read the mayor's proclamation, I'm going to give a, a few answers to the question that you just praised, raised. I'm going to give you um, my age. Fifty years ago, I was graduating from high school and ready to come to Keene State College. What was Keene like 50 years ago? Well, when I went to King State College, there was two young black women. They were twins. They were violinists, great individuals, but they were the only two black women in the whole King State College. When it came to black men at King State College, there was one on the cross country the track team there was one on the soccer team, and I think there was four or five on the basketball team. Those were the only black people that were at King State College 50 years ago. I think there was one black professor at the time that was Mr. Jones, who was a history um, professor. I graduated from King State College with a degree in history, and my major was in American history, and I never once heard about <clears throat> June 19th. It was not that important. It wasn't an event worth talking about when I was a history major and graduated. So. That's one of the reasons why we're here today. And so I hope those answer some of your questions. Okay. Proclamation, the city of Keene, New Hampshire. Whereas June, Juneteenth celebrates the day of June 19, 1865, when enslaved African Americans in Texas were informed by a general of the Union Army that they were free in accordance with the 
abolition of slavery as set forth in the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, and whereas since its first observance in 1866, the anniversary of this event has been celebrated in the American black community as an occasion to recognize the end of 246 years of chattel slavery on this continent, and whereas the state of New Hampshire, as well as 45 other states in the District of Columbia, now officially recognize June 19th, June, Juneteenth as a holiday observance, and whereas recent events in our country, including peaceful protests here in Keene, have underscored the need for our community to do better in recognizing and supporting those among us who are members of the minority communities and to work hard to, to be a welcoming and inclusive city. And whereas Juneteenth is an opportunity to celebrate African American culture, achievement, and freedom while educating people of all races about how the legacy of slavery continues in our society. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, George S. Hansel, Mayor of the City of Keene, do hereby proclaim the weekend of June 18, June 19, 2020, as Juneteenth in the City of Keene, recognizing its historic importance and encouraging all residents to join us in its celebration. In witness whereof I hereupon to set my hand and the official seal of the city of Keene, the 16th day of June, 2022, George S. Hansel, Mayor. Thank you so much, Councillor uh, Chris. Uh, let's talk about our ancestors. Uh, the next uh, speaker, um, or our first speaker, doesn't really need an introduction because uh, we probably know this speaker, all of us. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Do Dr. Doty Morris, um, Associate Vice President for... Yes, more, 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 more. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Dori uh, Morris, uh, she's the Associate Vice President for Institutional uh, Diversity and Equity at Keene State College. Uh, Dori is also a member of the Keene Human Rights Committee. So, Dori. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I can't do anything without acknowledging the land that we stand on. Uh, the first peoples, the indigenous people who uh, stewarded and took care of this place um, and instilled some of the beauty that remains as a result of their stewardship. Uh, so I don't want to just talk about the past, but I also want to talk about the present. Uh, when I think about uh, indigenous people, even in New Hampshire, uh, continue uh, to have to fight for rights uh, and personhood. So I always like to just you know, remember and connect with those first peoples uh, who walked this land uh, long before any of us were here, uh, either by choice or by force uh, to come to this land. So I just want us to sit and just marinate on that for a little while before we move forward. The other thing is, is uh, for me is Juneteenth is a very important time because this whole idea of ancestors and, and the idea that uh, so many things, when you think about the impact, especially of chattel slavery, um, which is a little di was a different than other forms of slavery. There's tons written on the difference between chattel slavery in the 49, uh, 40, excuse me, 48 uh, continuous states as opposed to other places uh, in the world. Um, but when I think about chattel slavery and how long it went, part of it was an attempt to dismember people, to pull them away. So the first thing was to rename people's bodies. Um, yeah, there's a famous scene in a movie that I watched uh, when I was in elementary school, uh, Roots, and you could see it in that process. The first thing uh, that they took away from him was his name and started calling him Kunta, his name was Kunta Kente. 
and they wanted to name him Toby. And they beat him and beat him and beat him until he disconnected. So those types of things are always important to me. And I always tell people that uh, I have no shame about coming from enslaved people um, because of the resiliency, you know, of the pride, and of all the things that they did. And um, one thing that I was reminded by a colleague of mine, Sky Stevenson, just yesterday, when you think about the number of ancestors it took for us to be here today, it just blows your mind. That they had to survive. When I think about all of those people working and toiling in the fields in Louisiana, all of those years, because you know what? They had the dream of me. They had the dream of my sister. They had the dream of my nieces. They had the dreams of generations that I can't even imagine. So when you think about coming from a people with that type of tenacity, all you can do is have a lot of pride in who they are. And I have no shame of coming from enslaved people. I have a lot of pride. The other thing I want to mention is this holiday is a U.S. holiday. It's an opportunity for people. Uh, there's a poem that I really like. Is, is, uh, you know, I treasure the day when enslaved people can sit with the ancestors of people who enslaved them. To have that conversation, because I'm telling you now, that will be a moment where we could heal. So for us, for us who were enslaved, for those of us who might come from ancestry that had enslaved, that enslaved people, how might you reconnect with your ancestors? Forgive them so you can move on and make amends. And I think that that's why this is such a U.S. holiday, of all holidays. I know in a few weeks we'll be such, uh, celebrating Independence Day of the United States. And so everybody thinks that's the all-American holiday. I think this is the one. This is the one where we could heal the wounds of the past. We could heal so many things that we are subjected to, all the lies that we tell each other and our children and ourselves about this country and come to terms. There's nothing like that. And I think in doing that, we can re-member. Because we need to remember. We need to become whole again because we've so disconnected, because we've lived with the great lie, okay? And so we need to confront those lies. We need to figure out a way that we can work through those together in love for one another. And this whole idea of personhood, we have to really keep thinking about that. So that's why I really like our theme about how we want to educate, how we want to you know, move forward. Because how do we move forward understanding what happened in the past and how we do it from a place of love and care and affection for one another. And I always like to tell people that we all came from the same place. Uh, and, and so we all have a common ancestor. And so when we're celebrating the ancestors, we're celebrating that common ancestor that we all have. So if this isn't the true meaning of what it means to be human is to reconnect including reconnect with all of our ancestors and then move forward. Uh, in a few minutes, you'll, uh, uh, a couple of people will do a trivia thing. And one of the prizes over there is a book by a woman named Octavia Butler. Uh, she was a, a science fiction writer. And uh, she wrote a book called Kindred. And uh, someone turned it to a graphic novel. Uh, and I'm one of those kind of, I'm starting to be an old person where I'm like, I prefer the original book written in 1979. Um, <laughs> but the graphic novel is, is good as well um, because I had the images already in my head and the images that the artist put in there. But part of it is coming to terms. Part of the premise of Octavia B Butler's book is someone coming to terms uh, with their, and con reconnecting with their ancestors. And one of their ancestors happened to be it's a really interesting book, but she goes back in time as a woman of African descent and meets one of her ancestors, who was this young white boy. Okay, so he was a boy at the time. She goes back in the past. She meets him. So that I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but it's interesting what unfolds within the story, and I think that that is what why we're gathered here today.
is to re-explore, to reimagine a world for these kids here and all the kids who are not here. So how do we connect with the ancestors, live the life that we're living, so we can move forward and forge a better life for everyone? So think about all of your, you want to name some of your ancestors? Yell them out, mail the names out. Fleming and Dorothy Morris, uh, Maddie and Moses Johnson, Theodore and Lois Williams, Theodore and Lois Williams, Norman Workman. Come on, who is that? Ralph Blood. And okay. And I need to let you all know that you too are future ancestors. What do you want the story to say? What do you want your future generations to say when they sit back and reflect on you as an ancestor? You are a future ancestor. And some of us are elders and some of us are emerging elders. What do we want to leave as our legacy? And those were the questions that Eve posed to us this morning, and I hope we can continue on that path. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day. Uh, we have some good stuff here uh, coming up, and it's an opportunity to even ask questions of each other. But most of all, ask questions of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dottie. Yes, that's really a good, uh, good question. What do we want to leave as our legacy? I think if, if we get up every, every morning and think about this question, and then later in the evening ask ourselves, what did we do to uh, prepare for leaving a good legacy? I think we probably be good people. Um, I just want to remind you that the coolers you see, uh, there is water, so please help yourself if you need uh, some water. Um, so I heard about trivia, uh, so we are going to uh, get some questions and uh, here there are some nice prizes there. So our councillor, uh, Kat uh, Workman, uh, who is our city councillor, um, has been focusing on increasing services to uh, fight against homelessness and substance uh, misuse. Among uh, the many interests, uh, Councillor Walkman continues to focus on attracting and retaining young professionals uh, in the area and also to ensure affordable housing options are available for uh, our residents. So, Councillor um, Walkman is going to lead us in Jeopardy. Thank you, Eve. All right, so I am looking for some crowd per participation. Do we have any brave souls that are willing to come up and participate in trivia? Any takers? <laughs> ah, we've got a fellow councillor, Bobby Williams. Thank you. Hi, Kat. Hi, everybody. Uh, do we have anyone else that may want to participate? Any other brave takers? Me one more. Come on, help me out. Oh. There we go. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause, guys. Come on. Yeah. Can we have your name? Uh, my name is Greg. Greg, thank you for braving the audience. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I promise I won't be too tough on you guys. Okay, I promise. Good. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's going to be multiple choice, so okay. you'll have two options to choose from. Um, what 34-year-old AA scientist is described as a, sci a key scientist behind the development of the COVID vaccine? You have Dr. Beverly Tatum or Dr. Kuzmika Cor Corbett. And I'll leave you with your choices. Uh, I'm gonna go with option B. Option B? I, uh, I agree, yes. <laughs> all right, any audience want to participate? A or B? B. B? 
Well, we've got a brave and smart crowd amongst us because that is right. Thank you guys. <laughs> All right. Who was credited for developing over 300 uses for peanuts? We have George Crumb or George Washington Carver. I will say B again. Okay. George Washington Carver, we learned that in fourth grade. <laughs> Are they right, guys? Again, very smart audience. I got to do some tougher questions now. All right, we're warming up. Which of the following African American women was an astronaut? We have Sonia Sanchez or Mae Jemison? Mae Jemison. Sure, sounds good. <laughs> Audience? <laughs> All right, I, I'm not picking the hard ones because that again is right. Good job, guys. Thank you. All right, here we go. What historically black, uh, sorry, most historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, were, create, were started during which years? 1915 through 1945, 1865 through 1900, or I'm throwing a third option out there now, 1975 or through 1980? One, 1915 to 1945. Okay. And I'm going with post reconstruction, 1865 to 1900. All right, that one no goes goes to Councillor Bobby Williams. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting tougher now. All right, here's a local one for you guys. Keene State College had an African-American president for seven years during 20, 2005 through 2012. What is, who is that person? Jay Khan or Helen Giles G? Uh, I think it's Helen. <laughs> I'm going with that as well. <laughs> All right, there you guys go. You guys got it. <laughs> Which HBCU did Vice President Kamala Harris attend? Hampton University, Howard University, or Spelman College? Howard. Yeah, I, I would say Howard as well, yes. All right. Howard University for the win. <laughs> you guys are really good. <laughs> Which historical case determined that laws that established racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional? I'm not going to give you an option on this one. We'll see if you guys get it. That would be Brown versus Board of Education. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, yeah, good job. <laughs> now, now we're getting into some of the history questions. What year did the first enslaved Africans arrive in Jamestown, Virginia? 1492, 1776, or 1619? 1619. 1619. Yep, 1619. Audience and crowd? All right, yes, again, 1619. And 
Who was the first woman and African American to seek the nomination for President of the United States from one of the two major political parties? Was it Barbara Jordan, Sheila Jackson Lee, or Shirley Chisholm? Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan. Unfortunately, no, that was Shirley Chisholm. Oh, we had audience members that knew that one. Uh oh. <laughs> we might have our participants for round two. You get one wrong and they go against us. <laughs> All right, here we go. How are we doing on time? Should we keep going, guys? Yeah. Yeah? All right. You guys are ready to keep going? Sure. All right. In another local one. In, in 1939, a new doctor came to Keene. The residents were not aware he was black. His name was Dr. Kenneth Clark, Dr. James Martin, or Dr. Al Albert Johnston. Albert Johnson. Yep, Albert Johnson. All right, we got some smart crew here. Albert Johnson. <laughs> All right. I might be a little disappointed if you guys don't get this one, or at least if Bobby doesn't get this one. <laughs> what civil civil rights leader and U.S. representative is known for encouraging people to get into good trouble? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, or Barack Obama? I'll say John Lewis. John Lewis. There you go, yes, yes. I, I like to get into good trouble myself. The Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire office is located in what city? Do, do we need multiple choice? All right. We've, we've got Concord, Portsmouth, or Manchester. I would, I would say Concord. No. I'm going with Portsmouth. All right. That was Portsmouth oh, for the win on that one. Yep. <laughs> All right. And we'll hope there, everyone's okay. Now, who was said to be the first person killed during the Boston Massacre? Crispus Attucks, Attucks John Brown? I guess I'll go with the first one. <laughs> Crispus Attucks. There you go, yes. All right, we're, we're, we're coming up. We're going to go into the final, final round right now, guys. This is for sports, entertainment, and literature. <laughs> Who is known as the Queen of Soul? Beyonce, Tina Turner, Gladys Knight, or Aretha Franklin? Aretha Franklin. Aretha. There you go. Yep. Who was the first African American quarterback to win the Super Bowl? Warren Moon, Russell Wilson, or Doug Williams? That would be Doug Williams for the Washington football team in 1986. <laughs> we have a sports buff on our hands. I figured he'd know that one, yeah. I was going to say that that I've, I'm going to rule as a tie because I did hear the answer from both sides at the same time. <laughs> All right, we got five more questions, okay? In the 2018 movie, Black Panther, who played the role of Black Panther? William Duke, Chadwick Bo Boseman, or Michael B. Jordan? Chadwick, Chad Boseman. 
I think it was Chad Bozeman, yes. Yes, yes it was. May he rest in peace. Yep. Who was the artist who read her poem entitled The Hill We Climb at President Biden's 2021 inauguration? Tony Blackman, Jessica Carr Moore, or Amanda Gorman? It was Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh. All right. My last count was at three, four. I, I haven't been counting. The Fresh Prince of Bel Air starred which rapper? LL Cool J, Snoop Dogg, or Puffy Combs, or Will Smith? Will Smith. Will Smith. Yes, Will Smith. Yep. Yeah. All right, one more. We'll go one more. The 2014 film Selma was directed by Spike Lee, Tyler Perry, Ava DuVernay, or Oprah Winfrey. You gotta ask the film guy over here. Ava DuVernay. <laughs> Ava DuVernay. Yes, yes. All right, let's give these gentlemen a big round of applause for being so brave. It's so nice to be here, an honor to be here for the second year in a row for our Juneteenth celebration, a very special and important day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Who was here? Hello? Hey, uh, who was here last year? Who remember Teresa? <laughs> how can you rem how can you forget Jerisa? So Jerisa Rodriguez, we are very happy and honored to have you back. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so, so much. Jerisa. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you. I am a proud queer Boricua, <laughs> daughter of a fierce queer Boricua mother activist. And I'm um, so happy to be here with you all. I want to start with a piece entitled Fire Love Drum Prayer. This is in honor of all freedom fighters. This is in honor of all the ancestors of these lands, the indigenous ancestors of these lands. This is a prayer for them, in honor of them, and in honor of all freedom fighters, and all those actively working for our collective liberation.
que se diga la clave. Eso. Uno, dos, tres. Uno, dos. 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 Eso. So proud of my African and indigenous ancestry, the daughter of Ada Maria Vera Tejera Piñero, who is the daughter of Maria Reyes Piñero, who is the daughter of Eulogia Piñero. With this song, I want to honor my ancestors my African and indigenous ancestors of Puerto Rico. I want to share a song with you called Campo Yo Vivo Triste. And this song is an Afro-Puerto Rican song, a bomba song de Puerto Rico. It is the music that was born out of the sugarcane fields 500 years ago of those that were enslaved those that were stolen from Africa, those indigenous people who were oppressed and who still are. And I want to perform this song in their honor and all of my ancestors and especially all of the women in my family. There's a line in this song that says, if I don't dance this bomba, I'm going to die. And I remember hearing the song for the first time and how it struck me that the drums, that anything that could be made into a drum was made into a drum so that the people could celebrate and honor one another, their survival, our ancestors. This is Campo Yo Vivo Triste. If any of you are moved to dance, I invite you to dance. There is so much beautiful space here, y'all. <laughs>
amazing dancers. Uh, Bomba doesn't happen without dance. They are, um, they happen together always. Beautiful, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm, how y'all feeling? <laughs> yeah! You feeling the spirit? <laughs> So glad. Mm. I want to take a moment to thank the esteemed, the most high, <laughs> the Dr. Reverend Dottie, Dean of Multicultural <laughs> Affairs at Keene State. If y'all don't know this powerhouse, if y'all don't know this power, <laughs> You better get to know. <laughs> I'm so grateful, so grateful to you and love you so much. Thank you for all that you do. You mean so much to so many of us. I can't even tell you how much. I wanted to be here today in honor of Juneteenth. I wanted to be here today in honor of Dr. Dottie. I thank you, I love you, I appreciate you. You are so important. <laughs> I love your light. I love your life. I love your everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bigger round of applause, y'all. Come on now. Come on now. Come on. Yes, so. <laughs> um, I would love. I would love for all of us to think right now. I would love for us all to take a moment to think of an ancestor or ancestors who loved without limitations, an ancestor or ancestors who fought, actively fought against racism, homophobia, transphobia, and all oppressive systems. I want you all to think of an ancestor or ancestors who fought for our collective liberation, who made many sacrifices so that you could be here and thrive, or a family member or members, or a community member or members, to thrive. I want you to take a moment to think of an ancestor or ancestors and when that name comes to you, I invite you to say their name or names out loud, loud and clear. I want you to send their names out into the universe in their honor and in remembrance and in reverence. For all that they were, all that they gave. I want you to take that moment now and I'd love to invite you to say their names loud and clear so that they can hear because they are with us now and they are listening. In honor and in thanks to Ada Maria Vera Tejera Piñero, to mi abuela Eulogia Piñero, and all of my abuelas, Say their names. I want to hear loud and clear. Say their names. Noelia Reyes. Yes, there we go. Thank you, Annie Morris. Maddie Sewell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's elevate, elevate, elevate. Xavier. Thank you. Come on, say it loud and clear. They're listening. They're listening. Lo Espeña. Thank you, Lo Espeña. Gracias. Come on now. Catherine McDermott. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. A 
Melissa Jackson, we elevate you. We thank you, Melissa. Thank you, gracias. Say it again. Annie McKenzie. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. We love you. We thank you. We thank you, Annie. Say it again. Piasilo. Thank you. Thank you. We elevate you. We thank you. We thank you. If you struggled to think of a name of an ancestor, if it didn't come to you or if you couldn't find it, I want to encourage you to be that ancestor. We are future ancestors after all. And I want you to encourage to be that ancestor. I want to encourage you to leave behind a legacy of dismantling all oppressive systems, to leave behind a legacy of love and collective liberation and let love guide you. Let love be at the center of it all. And with that, I have a poem to, that I want to share with you. It's called, You Hold Sway. In this moment in time, there is nothing more essential to the soul than love. Love that crosses all dimensions. Love that breaks through all barriers. Love that mends all broken things. I devote myself to this love. I hold a mirror to my heart and reflect on every part and piece of myself. I make peace with myself and love with abandon every bit so that I may sit and spend the hours and minutes loving all parts and pieces of you. I'm in it. I commit to you. In my heart, you hold sway. The unfolding symmetry of my soul expands within each moment our eyes meet and with every breath we share. I dare not compare, conceal it or give it away. I say every prayer that I know to the heavens that every good thing comes your way. That each day with you is longer and each night studded with the brightest stars. The time is slow. And every month is May. In my heart, you hold sway. My love for you dances between the constellations of my soul, dares traverse the depths of the unknown, flows like verses through the universe of my whole being. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? The colors of my love scatter across the sky like the northern lights, carrying all that I am at the speed of light. I invite you to ignite with me, take flight with me, create new worlds with me, radiate and unfurl with me, believe in magic with me, receive abundance with me. Behold resplendence with me, be whole with me. Endure with me, be pure of heart with me, conspire with me, be on fire with me. But love doesn't require you to give up a single thing. Love is like freedom bells that ring. It is the beauty you decide to bring, so never give up on finding new things to love about yourself. The world itself and everything in it. Love is a shared vision. In love, there can be no division. It is not confined to a single space or time. So suspend your disbelief in the divine and spend time believing in love. Love that illuminates all dark places. Love that reveals all truths. Love that heals all of you because it's true. True love is proof that we are here and we are winning. Sure as the world keeps on spinning. Now, let us go back to the beginning. In this moment in time, there is nothing more essential to the soul than love. Choose love. Make love your goal.
you, thank you all for having me. I hope you feel a little more connected to self, to spirit, to one another, to planet. I wish you all so much love. I have so much love and gratitude for everyone here. Love and love and love and love be with you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gracias, ancestros. All of my ancestors, all of my African and indigenous ancestors, all of my queer ancestors, thank you, thank you all. So beautiful to be with you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of this beautiful Juneteenth celebration. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another round of applause, please. Thank you, Julissa. Uh, I'm going to do something out of the ordinary and ask Dori Morris to thank Julissa for us. No. Oh, come on now. Don't make God work all the time over here. He's making me work. Thank you very much for that gift and that offering that you, uh, you gave us today. And uh, yeah, I felt it. It's important to feel it, and we, we feel connected. I know I feel more connected to everyone here uh, after being here in your presence. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dor Dori Morris. Um, Jurissa just mentioned something that is very special. There is nothing essential to the soul than love. So always remember that. Be love, give love, receive love, and we will make this world a, a, better, a better place. Um, our counselor, Kat Walkman, is going to share some healing words with us. Counselor Walkman. Thank you. So how's everyone feeling now? Nice and alive, right? So happy Juneteenth, everyone, and thank you for coming. I hope you're enjoying the event so far and will participate in the other Juneteenth celebrations throughout the city this weekend. I want to extend my thanks to the City of Keene Human Rights Committee, Keene State College, the Keene Public Library, as well as all the performers and organi organizers of today's celebration. I would also like to recognize that Dr. Pierre Morton, who was a phenomenal speaker last, at last year's event, had planned to participate this year but unfortunately could not be here today. The speech I will be reading is a collaboration of his words and mine. Take a moment and imagine that you and your progeny have been kidnapped from your home, imprisoned, separated from your loved ones, forced into brutal labor and systematically and legally stripped of your humanity and identity for more than 400 years, simply because of the color of your skin. Now imagine learning that you had actually been freed from that cruel experience and life two years earlier when a judge had ordered your release but for their own self-serving reasons, your captors never told you. Well, that's exactly what happened in real life. While the 4th of July is widely recognized and celebrated as the birth of American independence and freedom since 1776, the sad truth is that was not the reality for all Americans. Even with President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, in which he declared 
all people held as slaves within the United States as free and ordered the executive government to recognize and maintain their freedom through the codification of the 13th Amendment, it was not until June 19th, 1865, two years following that proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, the pres that President Lincoln's goal materialized and Juneteenth was born. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, Liberation Day, or Emancipation Day, celebrates this emancipation, which marks the day that all those who have been enslaved were finally and legally free. As a nation, we have attempted to move forward. The 13th Amendment offers protection from involuntary servitude and violence. The 14th Amendment ensures protections of the immunities and privileges, due process, and equal protection of the law. The 15th Amendment was created to prohibit voting discrimination based on race. I by no means want to discount these significant achievements. While progress has undeniably been made, we still have a ways to go. We can't ignore the fact a modern day loophole remains within our criminal justice system, which as we know, disproportionately targets people of color. As one of my favorite filmmakers and a trivia question today, Ava DuVernay's 13th highlights, the 13th Amendment did not completely abolish all forms of involuntary servitude. In fact, it carved out an exception. Citizens who have been convicted of a crime can and are legally forced into labor and work. While it varies from state to state, citizens who are in correctional institutions may not be able to vote. Upon release from incarceration, voting rights are not always automatically reinstated, creating additional barriers to voting. And depending on your criminal history, and despite serving a penal sentence, one may be prohibited from voting indefinitely. Today, African Americans commemorate this day as their Independence Day from legalized slavery explicitly based on the color of one's skin and ancestral ethnicity. Today, some descendants of formerly enslaved people conduct a pilgrimage back to their southern ancestral roots to commemorate the important date, while others celebrate with prayer, festivities, and familial gatherings. Now that the holiday is federally recognized, I would like to start, I would like you to start to reflect on how, what the holiday means to you. How do you want to honor the day moving forward? What traditions will you foster? How would you like the community to continue to celebrate and commemorate this day as a whole? But more importantly, how do we honor the legacy of Juneteenth every day? I hope we can recognize how much more alike we are than different while celebrating and learning from those same differences. As, you've, as we have seen in the recent years, true freedom is measured by the degree to which we enjoy all the rights and treatments of full citizenship. The right to vote unabridged by race or color. The right to be secure in our own persons through the promotion of equal justice. The unalienable rights to life, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness is for all of us. As we commemorate this day of independence, let us continue to work towards true liberty and reflect on the words of Frederick Douglass, who shared that freedom is the absence of necessity, coercion, or constraint in choice or action. Again, please think about what this day means to you when you leave here and how you will honor the legacy of Juneteenth. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think you're going too far. I'm gonna have you for the next, uh, the next task. So we are going to continue with some questions. Uh, and we still have some really good prizes there uh, to win, so... Okay, you ready? Okay. All right. All right. Do we have any more takers for any more trivia? No? Oh, we got a brave soul. Come on. Woo! Let's show them a big round of applause. <laughs> That's our, oh, we've, we've got another one. Oh, we're going to scoot over this way. That's okay. That's okay. We'll. We're going to do multiple choice, but do you mind sharing your name with the audience? My name is Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. And who do we have here? Athena. Athena, thank you for joining us, Athena. Are you guys having a good time? I'm the, I'm the one that shouted out that name. What was it? What? Hold on. <laughs> I'm the one that shouted out the name Ralph Blood. Good job. <laughs> All right. I thought I knew it. I thought I knew it. I just had to ask my mom to confirm it. <laughs> Understandable. It's nervous be it's nerve wracking be up up here a little bit, huh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna ask you guys few questions and it's going to be multiple choice so the book the color purple which is also a movie was written by Alice Walker or Mary Wells we're gonna let ladies go first okay Mary Wells option B option B Mary Wells it was actually Alice Walker. Alice Walker. Yeah. Good job, though. I know nothing about. That's okay. That's okay. I didn't know the lot, a lot of the answers to these questions either, but I have the answer sheet. <laughs> I don't think those ones are working. What is the best explanation of why February was selected as Black History Month? Oh, all right. Do you want to hear the, the options? All right. A, because it's the shortest month of the year. B, because it's the birth month of Fre Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and W.E. Boys. Or C, there is no agreed upon good reason. Middle. <laughs> the last one. All right. It is the birthplace of Frederick Douglass, 
Abraham Lincoln, or the birth month of Frederick Douglass, Abraham. We are almost there, um, almost there. I'd like to uh, ask the uh, library, Jay. Jay, 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 you're on? I know the library has uh, some good stuff out there. Uh, maybe Jay can uh, share one or two things about the programs they have. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jay T. I'm, oh, maybe I should get away from the, okay. I'm JP. I'm from the Keene Public Library. I'm the Keene Services Librarian. Um, we're happy to um, be at the event today. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, we are over here. We do have free buttons, free books for anybody who wants to take a book. Please do go ahead. Um, we're also signing people up for the summer reading program um, all summer long. If you do like to read, listen to books, be read to, um, listen to audio books, everything counts. As long as oh, I think I just cut out. Um, everything counts, um, and you can earn prizes um, as you um, log in your hours um, or minutes for um, reading all summer long. We have a ton of different programs for different age groups. Um, so there's some flyers over there that will show you what programs we have for toddlers, youth, teens, adults, family programs. Um, there's a couple exciting things we have going on um, next week. Um, I have a teen lock-in, so if there's any teenagers here who would like a murder mystery, we're going to have a murder mystery lock-in. Um, there's a great program um, at the end of the summer called Chautauqua, which is like a living history program where we have performers um, um, acting as historical figures. Um, we're going to have a youth program as well, Youth Chautauqua. So if any youth like to do research, learn about performing, um, we have a program next Wednesday that we're going to talk about the program. And throughout the summer, we're going to have um, workshops um, showing you how to research, how to learn about your character, um, and how to perform um, working with the Edge Ensemble. Um, so the Chautauqua, um, the adult one is going to be in August, and the youth one is going to be in September. I'm sorry, I don't have all the dates right here. Um, and um, we're very excited to have TJ Wheeler here. So he's going to be performing for us. Um, and I thank you so much for coming out, and I hope you enjoy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I think we are almost there. I've seen some movies with it, like in the intro. Yep. All right, so this is going to be a guess for the both of you. So do we have A, Motown, or B, Def Jam? A. A. Now this is one from my time. This one is Def Jam Records. <laughs> But I want to give you guys both a big round of applause. Weren't they awesome, guys? And would you guys like to have any final words? Yee. Have, have anything to say to the audience? Nice. All right. Thank you, guys. Give a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, you guys have prizes there. Come on, go get something good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next is reparations. What does that mean? 
I invite our next speaker, Ura Let, who is going to tell us a little bit about himself and share uh, what he prepared for us today. Please join me in the welcome, Red. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. When I first got the word that uh, I was being invited by uh, King State College to a Juneteenth event, uh, I kind of, it caused me to have a flashback from my days working at New Hampshire College uh, as a uh, adjunct professor. And I was sure that I would be in an auditorium with the podium. You know, I thought I was like, man, do I need to wear a tie? <laughs> but I made one concession. I said, okay, I'll just write down, you know, what my presentation, uh, because I know people are going to be asking me about references and footnotes and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, uh, here I am, we out here, and uh, uh, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, as it was mentioned, my name is Willard Lett. I moved to New Hampshire from Chicago in the early 90s uh, to work at, at New Hampshire College, and since then have been active in various uh, social justice activities. The, uh, there was the Martin Luther King Coalition back in the old days before uh, there was a state holiday here in, the, in, in New Hampshire and uh, have continued to be active with the NAACP and other initiatives. And most recently, I was involved in the creation of a chapter of an organization uh, named the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And uh, we set up a state, uh, not a statewide, actually a region-wide chapter. So we have a New England chapter. And uh, I believe that was part of the reason why I may have been um, invited here today. So, I come before you today to talk about a historical experience and a historic event. The creation of a new national holiday designation is not a small matter. It has huge implications, both social, economic, and political. It also has a spiritual uh, implication. What I will attempt today is to address all these elements related to this issue. Now, most of us are aware that the crime against humanity of African chattel enslavement played a role in the internecine military conflict commonly referred to as the American Civil War. Many of us are not clear what that role was or how it came to be that the African chattel enslavement system, commonly known as the slave trade, existed what forces contributed to its demise, and finally, what ended, what lingering vestiges remain, and what we can do to identify and eliminate them. We are here today to discuss the significance of the newly minted Juneteenth holiday. It has been described since its inception as a day of celebration. In fact, you may see or actually be greeted with the words, Happy Juneteenth. If it has not happened yet, if you haven't been greeted in this way yet, do not take that as an indicator that you won't. Just wait. Who knows? Maybe I will end my brief presentation today with those words just to ensure that you are not deprived of the experience. But the characterization of this event as a celebratory day can be problematic without context. 
our friend Ngugi Wa Thiongo, the celebrated Kenyan novelist, reminds us of the importance of language and memory in describing our past, defining our present, and determining our future in his work, Something Torn and New. So let's start at the end, today's celebration of Juneteenth as a holiday. Go back to the origin of the beginning, which the American philosopher Gerald Horn has termed the counter-revolution of 1776. Touch on the historical events that occurred in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865. And finally, let's think about what all that means going forward into our shared future. The dominant narrative in society tells us that Juneteenth is a day worthy of celebration because it marked the end of African chattel enslavement in the United States of America with the reading of General Order Number 3 by Union Army General Gordon Granger announcing the Emancipation Proclamation which had been enacted two years earlier on June 19, 1865, proclaiming freedom for enslaved people in Texas. According to the dominant narrative, this announcement and the enforcement of the provisions of the Emancipation Proclamation in Texas considered, is considered the effective end of African chattel enslavement in the United States of America. This is a false narrative. So what are we celebrating today when we say we are celebrating Juneteenth? The American Civil War was grounded in the attempt by some to maintain an economic, social, and political system that was based on the dehumanization of the African personality and the European imagination. It is not common knowledge that even abolitionists of European descent considered people of African descent inferior. While they conceded that African people were human, they did not consider them equal to people of European descent. However, to justify treating African people as property, the meme, the idea, the dehumanization of the African personality in the European imagination was a feature and factor alive and commonly accepted in American society. The prospect of losing the right to exploit and economically benefit from the inhumane system of African chattel enslavement led to a call to arms by the fathers and sons of the Confederacy. But why would the children of a nation that declared that the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness have been endowed by the Creator for all of its, all of us, and served as its very reason for ex existence. Why would they, someone adopt such a stance? We have to visit our friend Gerald Horn's thesis regarding the counter-revolution of 1776. In that reading of history, we find the country of England on the cusp of declaring the international transatlantic chattel enslavement system illegal. In response to the prospect of being denied access 
to this source of labor and economic benefits, the English American colonies declared their independence. The descendants of those slaveholding founding fathers were just carrying on the same tradition of maintaining African chattel enslavement with the declaration of the second Civil War. The enslavers won the first Civil War on the battlefield, which we call the Revolutionary War. And the enslavers lost the second Civil War on the battlefield. But the ideas and the ideology that supported African chattel enslavement were never seriously challenged, disrupted, or displaced. So we have a situation where during the American Civil War, an edict called the Emancipation Proclamation was issued that said, if you were not submitting to the authority of the federal government, then you were commanded to end African chattel enslavement. But if you continue as part of the federal government, you were allowed to maintain African chattel enslavement. This was a ploy to woo some of the Confederate states back to the Union and to reward states that remained loyal. It was not intended to address the dehumanization of the African personality in the European imagination. The General Order Number 3, read by Union Army General Gordon Granger, on June 19, 1865, announcing the Emancipation Proclamation, which had been enacted two years earlier, did not call an end to slavery. It enforced the punishment of those in rebellion by denying them the right and the benefits of the crime against humanity of African chattel enslavement. The 13th Amendment, which was passed by Congress and ratified by the required states on December 6, 1865, ended slavery. OK, so what is the significance of Juneteenth for us here today? What does it mean to have it as a national holiday? First, the idea that we would celebrate Juneteenth is an act of forgetting an emotional amnesia regarding the fact that the plantation productive system were concentration camps. The African Holocaust, or Ma'afa, which means great disaster, in the East African language Swahili is often unacknowledged and often ignored. When the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, Dachau, Buchenwald, Auschwitz were liberated, certainly there was joy. But the event was not converted into happy concentration camp day or some other innocuous characterization that hid or ignored the horror and inhumanity that the experience represents. Yes, it is cause for happiness that good was done in the world, but it was not and should not be looked upon as an act of charity that was done for or on behalf of the other. It must be understood and acknowledged that it was an act of justice that reflected our common covenant as members of the human family. 
We should commemorate all those who had suffered because of the crime against humanity of African chattel enslavement, not celebrate our responsibility to each other as some gracious act of charity. Declaring the day of June 19th as the June 19th holiday is an act of acknowledgement. It is a move towards telling the truth about what happened to us all, but the abused and the abuser, the injured and the injurer, the enslaved and the enslaver. Acknowledgement is truth telling, but to get from truth to reconciliation is not a straight path or a short jump. We have to address accountability. While we ended the institution of African chattel enslavement, while we acknowledge that it was a crime against humanity, we cannot jump from truth to reconciliation without accountability. Without accountability, we allow the injury to linger. Without accountability, we are all the wrong, we allow the wrong ideas of the injurer to fester, inflame, and reoffend. Accountability is repair. Accountability is reparations, because reparations means repair. Without accountability, we have black codes and Jim Crow laws. Yes, let's celebrate the arrival of the Union soldiers in Galveston, Texas in June 1865 and the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation. We appreciate the acknowledgement of the national holiday. It is necessary, but insufficient to acknowledge without accountability. Without accountability, we have 100 years of lynchings. Without accountability, we have the red summer of 1919. Without accountability, we have Rosewood, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and sundown towns across the nation and sundown neighborhoods in cities across the country. So if Juneteenth constitutes acknowledgement, what constitutes accountability? Reparations constitutes accountability. Reparations means repair. We don't get to atonement. We don't get to reconciliation without accountability. The injuries inflicted on people of African descent as a result of African chattel enslavement still lingers. The National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America identifies five injury areas resulting from African chattel enslavement and its vestiges. These areas include nationhood and peoplehood. The intentional and conscious denial of the humanity of African people that supported this, uh, this heinous system. Another injury area is health. The health injury area consists of both mental health from the terrorism, the terroristic practices that were required to hold African people in bondage, in bondage and to uh, attempt, to attempt, unsuccessfully mind you, but to attempt to uh, convince people that, you know, it's okay for uh, uh, the kinds of practices, the kinds of behaviors that uh, occurred. I myself am the product of my mother's father's father having 
been a, a man of European uh, descent who raped an African woman that he was enslaving. So this uh, you know, issue of, of trauma and uh, mental health is real and alive because we can't even get to post-traumatic stress syndrome because the trauma hasn't ended. And then in the arena of health, there's physical health. You know, we know that uh, trauma can affects the genetic makeup of people. It's called epigenetics, where trauma is internalized physically and transmitted so that you end up having transgenerational transfer of historical trauma. So health is a major injury area. Education. We know that uh, during the time of uh, African chattel enslavement that it was actually against the law for people of African descent. Okay, for people of African descent. Hey, I was told, it's like, you know, you got uh, 30 minutes to talk about this. It's like 30 minutes? Wow, do I have enough to say? I'm gonna speed it up a little bit so I can get to this. Uh, education. So, you know, we have, we, we know that uh, many of us may be familiar with the fact that um, in the area of education during African child enslavement, it was against the law to, to teach people of African descent to read, whether free or enslaved. Also, uh, one of the major challenges that we face is the, the level of misinformation and disinformation in the educational materials. We see that now today with the backlash against what's commonly referred to in the popular media as critical race theory. Uh, criminal punishment is a major uh, injury area for people of African descent because law enforcement, courts, and, correct, and the correctional institutions aren't designed to uh, serve and protect communities and people of African descent. They're designed to command and control them. So in, in, for people of African descent, there's not a criminal justice system, there's a criminal punishment system. Also, um, poverty and wealth, the area of economics, you know, is a major injury area for people of African descent. And, and um, we look at this in light of the international uh, definition of reparations and the five remedies that international law offers uh, in the area of reparations. Those include restitution, restoring a people to its former state before the offense was committed, rehabilitation. Again, rehabilitation deals with addressing some of the mental and the physical injuries suffered Compensation. Compensation is necessary, but compensation alone is insufficient for full repair. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about reparations. Uh, a fourth element of uh, reparations in international law is cessation and a guarantee of non-repeat. And as we look at American society, we see Charles, the, the shooting in the church in Charleston, South Carolina. We see the shooting in the grocery store in Buffalo, New York. We see both citizen murders as well as uh, official police murders of people of African descent. So we haven't gotten to the point yet where the uh, injuries have ceased. And the, the fifth and final element of the international definition of reparations is satisfaction. Satisfaction uh, includes memorializing, putting memorials and acknowledging the uh, harms created as part of a process of accountability. So let's commemorate the loss, the grief, the cruelty suffered, the inhumanity of the dehumanization of the African personality in the European imagination, and let's celebrate the resilience, the fortitude, the sacrifice in the ability to overcome seemingly impossible odds, the willingness to endure the unthinkable, and finally, let's acknowledge our shared humanity. Let's honor our covenant as a human family by acknowledging the justice 
of ending African chattel slavery. This is necessary, but by itself, doing this alone is insufficient. Let's use Juneteenth to seek accountability. Let's work towards repair. Let's work towards reparations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much today. Uh, why we uh, don't go too far? Don't go too far. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> uh, why we uh, we give uh, people uh, time to uh, to prepare. Uh, anybody has a question? Always, soon, soon. Any question to read? Anybody has a question? Comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm really good at questions. I know, that's why. <laughs> you have a question? No, I have something to say. Sure, why not? Hey, man, I think everyone around here is one of us to all be one to each other. You know, if we can't be here for one with each other, then we shouldn't, you know. Love, love. Thank you, thank you. Always. Yes, Jen. I'm wondering, I'm wondering um, how much, uh, I guess, success you're having and what area is one area of the five uh, parts of the reparations, uh, what do you feel you're making the most progress in? The answer is yes. <laughs> because actually what we're talking about, you know, one of the things that we have to deal with is the fact that we live in a culture that is very low context. And generally, it demands that you can only be one thing. There can only be one answer, you know. And the reality is that for full repair, we have to deal with all of the various aspects. But a fundamental, a fundamental grounding issue that we have to deal with is uh, the injury of peoplehood and part of the remedy of restitution is us recognizing our common humanity. You know, we talked about education and misinformation and disinformation in education. We're here in a college town, and I'm sure I could go around the, uh, the room and ask, well, what race are you? What race are you? And everybody would answer, when in reality, there's no such thing as race. But that's so, such an embedded part of the, uh, but the culture and the society that, you know, I mean, that's where we're starting and we have to do it all at once. Excellent, thank you. Um, one more question, I see a question coming from that area. We get a copy of your, <laughs> <laughs> I wanna see it again. <laughs> I want a copy of the, uh, the whole thing, including what you didn't put in, right? Uh, oh, and the answer to your question is human. That's my race. Yes, yes. Because I was coming to, uh, normally I may not have uh, written down my, you know, comments and I'll speak, you know, extemporaneously, off the cuff. I'm here among friends. But because I was coming to the college, I did write them down. I'll provide them and they'll be available for those folk who would like them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the library has uh, some good stuff out there. Uh, maybe Jay can uh, share one or two things about the programs they have. Welcome everybody. I'm JP. I'm, oh, I think I should get away from that. Okay. I'm JP. I'm from the Keene Public Library. I'm the Teen Services Librarian. Um, we're happy to um, be at the event today. Um, thank you everybody for coming out. Um, we are over here. We do have free buttons, free books for anybody who wants to take a book. Please do go ahead. Um, we're also signing people up for the summer reading program um, all summer long. If you do like to read, listen to books, be read to, um, listen to audio books, everything counts as long as you... Oh, I think I just cut out. Um, everything counts, um, and you can earn prizes um, as you um, log in your hours um, or minutes for um, reading all summer long. We have a ton of different programs for different age groups. Um, so there's some flyers over there that will show you what programs we have for toddlers, youth, teens, adults, family programs. Um, there's a couple exciting things we have going on um, next week. 
Um, I have a teen lock-in, so if there's any teenagers here who like a murder mystery, we're going to have a murder mystery lock-in. Um, there's a great program um, at the end of the summer called Chautauqua, which is like a living history program where we have performers um, um, acting as historical figures. Um, we're going to have a youth program as well, Youth Chautauqua. So if any youth like to do research, learn about performing, um, we have a program next Wednesday that we're going to talk about the program and throughout the summer we're going to have um, workshops um, showing you how to research, how to learn about your character, um, and how to perform um, working with the Edge Ensemble. Um, so the Chautauqua, um, the adult one is going to be in August and the youth one is going to be in September. I'm sorry I don't have all the dates right here. Um, and um, we're very excited to have TJ Wheeler here. So he's going to be performing for us. Um, and I thank you so much for coming out. And I hope you enjoy. OK, I think we are ready for some music. What kind of music do you expect? Blues. Blues. Yes, baby. <laughs> Blues. So uh, we are honored today to uh, be with uh, TJ Wheeler. Um, a blues musician, uh, musician from Portsmouth. Uh, he performs his gumbo of blues, jazz, and more on various instruments. Um, I hear he travels the world to bring, to bring blues to kids. And uh, he tells them, you sing blues to lose blues. Um, and then, uh, TJ is accompanied by uh, Reverend Lillian Buckley, who is a preacher, a teacher, an activist, a singer of traditional gospel, freedom song, and songwriter. And uh, she's uh, interim minister at the New Hope Baptist Church in Portsmouth as well. So please help, uh, help me welcome uh, both TJ and uh, Lillian. Yes, let's have a nice, nice hand for the, this gentleman over here, Eve, and the gentleman that was speaking so elo eloquently and so wisely and so incisively. And uh, I hope you all were paying attention to what the man was saying, because those are, those are very important words. We, we got to keep hope alive, but, but hope and prayers have to be combined with pragmatic tactics, right? To get, reach our goals. So we gotta get, get ourselves together because there's some dark forces out there. <laughs> yes, indeed. There's a lot of songs, you know, uh, in folk music, in, in spirituals, in blues, uh, about the role of the stranger. You know, we had, a, was often told we have immigrants that came from all over the world that chose to come here. But the, the stranger in the strange land was really uh, African, Africans that were brought here against their will and without little cause or explanation, but robbed or sold and stolen regardless and so uh, I, uh, this first song is about that wayfaring stranger. And uh, without further ado, let's give wonderful, wonderful speaker, educator, it happens to be a reverend, songwriter, and singer of freedom songs, many of which she's written herself. Let's have a nice hand for Reverend Lillian Buckley. Thank you. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe, but there's no sickness, toil, or danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roll. I'm just going over Jordan. 
American in northern New England. I was born and raised in Kittery, Maine, and you always felt in class that you were the only one. You always were the only one, and you better get used to it and smile and just do it. So you always felt displaced like a stranger, and you always felt like this is not exactly what life is going to always be like. Something's better is coming. This next song talks about that better. When you've got shoes and you can go wherever you want to go, there are no signs where you're off limits. You don't feel like you don't belong. And it's a city called heaven. I got shoes. You got shoes, all I got shoes and got shoes, my lord. When we get to heaven, gonna put all the shoes we gonna walk. We gonna talk all over God's heaven. We get to heaven, gonna put on our roof. 
inspires me uh, because because of his accomplishment and his age. So um, jo uh, Jonah Wheeler, uh, he is a, a high school a Convar high school graduate, and now I hear you are at Franklin Pierce. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Jonah. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank Reverend Jackson and TJ Wheeler for their music. Give me a round of applause again. I want to thank Kat for inviting me here today. <laughs> the city of Keene for letting me speak here. 
and all of you beautiful people for showing up today. We gather to honor the legacy of a people, human beings who were sold by leaders drunk on greed, forced into boats on chains, stripped of their clothes, their children, their humanity, beaten out of them by men hailing from a nation whose declaration of independence guaranteed the freedom of all men, proclaiming their equality. Men who had freed themselves from the tyranny of the British Empire, using human beings as chattel to build a new empire, which would go on to overshadow the former, building wealth and power greater than any nation to ever grace the, the face of this earth that the slave would never see. Human beings of all ages, broken down into animals by those on the power trip of a generation. Their world reduced into servitude and after so long, servitude being their world. Generations of children growing up and passing on knowing nothing other than the horror of their day. 157 years ago tomorrow, after the war for freedom, two centuries of that barbarity, and months after the Emancipation Proclamation, the slaves in Texas were told that they were free. No matter how much the master told the house slave that they were equal to the pig being put on the table, they knew that they were more than that. No matter how much a man was beaten for standing up for his wife, he continued to stand. No matter how often they were told they could not read, they read. No matter the beatings for singing, they sang. Against a machine doing everything it could to, to dehumanize them in the most violent of ways, they never conceded their spirit, never gave an inch on their humanity. Their will brought them through the darkest of eras and they found a horizon. Amidst the crack of the whip, they sang. They found community where there was none. Not under the idea that they would one day be free of their chains. In fact, they thought that their chains were forever. Not in revenge nor malice, no. They found a community in love. An unconditional and radical love for one another. Solidarity in the idea that they were in this together on those hot, humid nights on the plantation, lying outside on the hay, looking up at the stars in their infinite glory, feeling alone, broken, just about to believe what their master told them about the pig when they hear a voice beside them, singing a quiet hymn to themselves. The deep voice of another joins in, the high pitch of a child, another voice, and another, and the other, and you start to feel the urge to sing. But the worries of the day overwhelm you. The desperation of the hour overwhelms you and you do not. Then your mother grabs your arm, looks in your eyes, and starts to sing. Next thing you know, you join her, and all of those worries, all of those desperate hours, all of the cracks of the whip, everything that they had gone through washes away. And a symphony of love, knowing that they'll be beaten worse come daylight, singing nonetheless rings out on that farm. The broken voices of all those lonely people coming together in a harmony of resistance. We gather today to enshrine this legacy of love and resilience. This legacy of a people who never allowed their spirit to be shattered by those whose spirit had been twisted so far. We gather to ensure that legacy never fades. We gather to honor freedom. The ability to live how one chooses, to love how one chooses, and to speak one's mind freely, all without restraint. Their freedom was never fully realized, but this is a day of celebration nonetheless, a day of independence for those in chains. 
As much as they continued to endure the horror of being made out to be less than human, they continued to grow love warriors who would speak truth of, of, of a fire with an oppressed people who had had enough. The artists who sang with soul, the prophets who brought us the word of God, the children who reminded us to love without condition, all unwavering in their pursuit to fully realize a new world. As we reflect on the horror of the past, it is important for us to reflect on where we've come since then. Have we yet achieved the freedom owed to us all as a result of being a human being born into this world? I was born and raised here in New Hampshire, hopping from house to house because we could never truly afford a house, going weeks eating scraps, never settling down. My mother worked as many jobs as she could just to keep our nose out of the water and was still drowning, waking up knowing that you will do nothing today but work. Think about work or pay a bill using the fruits of your labor only to repeat that cycle the next day. On the rare event you get a day off, you're worried about losing time that could be used to catch up on those bills, to catch up on where you've been, to get out of the water. Watching a world with technology from a science fiction novel of the 20th century up and forget about you. Listening to news which is not relevant to you or your struggles. Feeling alone, broken, and made out to believe that this is all there is. Accepting that your life will be lived in the service of another's pursuit for power. Free. Free to, free to use your only spending power to buy a life-saving medicine from someone trying to make a buck off your sickness. Free to give everything you've earned away for the leftovers of those with everything. Your basic needs locked behind a paywall with the twisted smile of oligarchs looking down at you, all while you're made out to be grateful. The sedatives of the modern world, the computer, your phone, the push to start car, the widescreen television, the chic clothes, the opioids given out with glee, the weapons, all of it, built off the backs of people you will never see with harrowing stories you will never hear. Put together using the hands of children who know nothing but a smog-filled walk down to the factory floor building objects they will never see, they will never use, for sense that can be only used to feed themselves into the next day. These objects make our, their way to us on the grandest ships ever to sail the ocean pumping fuel into our ecosystems, ramming through whales, only to bring you and I our distraction. Those distractions keeping us engaged in this world of enforced fiction. The policies which legalize this horror passed by figureheads elected using the capital of multinational corporations that hold allegiance to no flag. Figureheads who use pretty words and sacred buildings to put on a show of gridlock when it comes to the issue of poverty while spending nearly all of you and I's tax dollars on, the fun, on funding the most brutal wars that the, this planet has ever seen. Destroying entire regions to gather the oil necessary to fuel the destruction of the next. With no second thought, Corporations firebombed the cradle of civilization, subjecting the people who live there to instability that, is, that has no end. With no guilt, moving to the next. And as we, spent, as we speak, our tax dollars are, are being funded to the Saudi regime to, in its nonstop bombing of Yemen and the starvation of its people. Our military uses siege warfare in Syria to stop any resource from entering the nation. Siege warfare, a medieval tactic used in the Dark Ages to break down a people. All of this under the guise of bringing about democracy. All of this under the guise of freedom. 
Soldiers who come from poverty here in the United States told that they can get a better life here if they just join to protect and defend their nation. Sent off to a faraway desert believing you're there to crush an enemy which hates you. Ordered to invade people's homes and seeing the pictures on their wall. The altars, the dinner tables left with food on them. The whole of a drone strike through a child's room. Realizing what you have done and the realities of where you are. Only to come home and be hailed as a hero. All for the behest of corporate oligarchs who seek control, wealth, and power. Who care not about you, nor the people you are inflicting this pain on. Who cares not about what they have done. Who cares not about the soldier who comes home to kill themselves after being made to kill other poor people whose struggle echoes their own. My story of a family in poverty feeling less than somebody is not unique. It is the story of billions worldwide, with hundreds of millions more in a far worse situation. All while BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, the three largest Wall Street firms in the world, buy up owning power in every single corporation, consolidating already dangerously centralized power to the tune of 20 Two trillion dollars. A number which is hard to comprehend for even the most well-read accountant. This is not freedom, nor is it democracy. It is oligarchy, plain and simple, and we must call it out as such. These are times of great catastrophe. You don't need me or anyone else to tell you that. We all feel the overwhelming nature of the times we're in, the impossibility of the situation, and how fast we all are sinking. The cloud of apathy hover, hovers over us all. This is a moment where we all need to ground ourselves in the courage of our ancestors, all the ancestors, those who fought for freedom wherever they found themselves those who never conceded their spirit. It's time for us as the love warriors of the day to be love warriors. As we are told we are less than, we must proclaim that we are more. We must stand with our back up straight and our hearts on fire, ready to face the dogs, the batons, whatever will be thrown at us because we will never let our spirit die because we will never let our voice be quieted, because we are human beings of the toughest cloth and the will of thousands of years of oppressed people ready to say enough. We cannot allow the, slave, the life of the slave who never gave up or the child who never saw the mountaintop, those with a radical love for all, their lives and their deaths to be in vain. We have to look within and deal with our own cowardice. A cowardice which causes us to make decisions based on whether or not it is safe. Whether or not it will be liked by the oligarchy. Is it comfortable? The majority of us here in this world do not have the luxury of that decision. The Goliath, which is multinational corporations and the oil barons. Pharma executives, prison executives, the oligarchs that run them. Recognize that they are at an end game. That there ain't much else in this world to slap concrete onto. That the drilling has destroyed the water, making it undrinkable for hundreds of millions, including people here in New Hampshire. And we, and they know that there is only so much time left. They're squeezing the lemon one last time, and we cannot be the first generation to concede this fight. We have to be David, taking on Goliath with an orchestra of voices from all people, black, white, 
gay, straight, man, woman, whatever your gender, sexuality, this is a moment to revive a symphony of brotherhood which gave generations of people hope. A symphony of brotherhood which will take on a great evil and once again bringing forth a world of love, compassion, and justice for every single person in it. Yeah. Unlocking the golden gates of justice and stepping into a new world for all of us. We're going to let freedom ring. Yeah. Our horizon is right there. And one way or the other, I will see each and every single one of you at a promised land. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Happy Juneteenth. Yeah. You're not realized. I had nothing. <laughs> oh, I hear he's, he's running for a state. State rep. State rep. Oh, nice. Good luck. I was going to say, actually, as, as he was speaking, uh, I was thinking, man, this guy is going to be president from New Hampshire at some point. <laughs> so. We have high hope, high hopes in you. Thank you. Uh, so as we are wrapping up, I want to thank everyone who joined us uh, today. But I want to uh, thank the committee that organized uh, this event. Uh, those who are organized the, the, this event, could you please come off? Come off. Come on. <laughs> Andy, come on. I know you are on the team. Behind the scene, come on. <laughs> you want to see some dancing. <laughs> and I started, come on. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the hard work you put into into this. And uh, um, I don't know if any of you has a final word. Yes. I think you guys have all heard me speak enough, so I'm going to pass the mic to my left. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I just want to thank this group of ladies for the amount of work that they do. It is incredible. Um, they started back in February working on this uh, event, and all the hard work that goes into it paid off today, so thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, we'll see you next year. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.